Linda Quinlan. I'm Ann Charles. I'm Keith Ghostland. This is All Things LGBTQ. We're back. Did you miss us? <laughs> Were you home long enough to learn how to cut your own hair? Today is Tuesday, April 21st. We are recording remotely in Montpelier, which we acknowledge is unceded indigenous land. So now some headlines. Linda, take it away. Okay, and I have for headlines, um, I, I want to do a, a report on the death of my friend in New York City named Vittoria Rapetto. Um, and also a little story about another lesbian icon in Phyllis Lyons who dies. Uh, ACLU files a lawsuit challenging Idaho's ban on transgender athletes. Queen Lativa openly discusses her celeb crush on Brazilian supermodel and Indiana Lima. Masterpiece Cake Shop is in trouble again um, and is going back to court for refusing to um, uh, service a transgender person. Um, Tammy Baldwin of Wisconsin comes out in support of Biden. San Francisco and New York City Pride have both been canceled. Uh, Paige Keisman, who was kicked out of the military for being a transgender woman, is now running for office. The guerrilla activist, Rev Billy69, we have a picture of him, and he's decked out in a pink suit and a bandana mask, was arrested on Sunday afternoon in Central Park. City Lights Bookstore in San Francisco raises $450,000 to pay their employees during the COVID-19 epidemic. Um, I have some entertainment news. The latest project from, a, from film and TV creator Ryan Murphy uh, Florida police chief is now on leave and it's National Library Week and the theme for this year's celebration has been find your place at the library where LGBT books have been hard to find. So that's my headlines. Well, I have news from four continents. Um, it's been five weeks since we recorded, so there's a lot to cover, but you know, we had to select a little bit. Starting with uh, Europe, an Amsterdam gay couple is spat at and called cancer homos. I have a picture of the crime scene. They were going to the grocery store um, and set upon by some teenagers who began to taunt them and then became physical. And as you can see, a bystander, the picture before you is of the, the um, thugs or the uh, harassers. And you see the bystander trying to intervene. But then two of them came back and spat on the young men, which of course is very dangerous in these times, um, and fled. So they made a viral video and are speaking out about it. British hurdler, Ethan Akani, has come out and uh, he says that coming out as a gay athlete has boosted his confidence. I have a picture before you of him now. Um, he identified, he came out in college and identify him, identified himself with the famous rainbow laces. And so then formed a, you know, attracted other gay people. They formed a gay group in athletics and uh, they're doing a lot of exciting things. So he's very pleased. The third story from Europe is also, um, is good. Leo Varadkar, whom we may recall, was the first openly gay prime minister of Ireland and also the youngest prime minister. He's also a registered doctor. So, well, he's re-registered now. So he's going to be serving as a conduit for people who have the virus who call in. 
I have a picture before you of him, even in case you don't remember what he looks like. So that's Europe. Latin America, um, good and bad news. The top America's court has found Peru responsible for the torture and rape of a trans woman. Um, it happened in 2008. The police buried the story, didn't charge anybody, although security guards, um, the security agents are the perpetrators. Um, so now the, um, the court, the Latin American court has um, uh, indicated that Peru is responsible. So I'm hoping action will follow. In Argentina, there's great news in a couple of pictures. A bid to make language gender neutral gains traction. And I'll, like, I'll explore that in greater detail. Africa, bad news. A giant online outing campaign is underway in Morocco. This, you know, it's just incredible. A gay activist um, elicited all these women to go on social media, Grindr, um, Romeo, and solicit gay men, and then um, he's outed them on social media. And his misguided efforts here um, are to prove that there are a lot of gay people in Morocco, but of course he's putting them in great danger, especially if they're home with their families who um, reject them. There's been a lot of uh, unfortunate backlash and personal um, pain as a result of this misguided political strategy. Um, the LGBTQ in Uganda, a community, a LGBTQ shelter in Uganda was raided uh, ostensibly over social distancing. 20 men were taken into custody. Um, three were um, left to stay in place because they were sick. But of course, the 20 people who were detained now are at greater risk of COVID-19. And uh, they were released, but you know, it's harassment. Um, more news from around the world in Asia. The Philippines uses humiliation as a COVID-19 curfew punishment. And I'll tell you a little more about that. Indonesia police will not bring murder charges in the case of a transgender woman who was burned to death. And this is an awful story I'll tell you about. Uh, and the best news, or very exciting news, is Taiwan. Taiwan has, um, is Taiwan's based yet gay Netflix is going global. And this is a good time for them because of the coronavirus and people staying at home. So I'm going to talk more about some of these stories in detail, but now let's go to Keith. So what I would like to talk about is first our trivia question, which I didn't ask them in advance. So we'll see how good they are when we get to the answer portion. September 17th. 1985. Why is that a date the LGBTQ plus community should remember? Then I want to talk a little bit about the FDA and their new regulation about blood donation from men who have sex with men. And then maybe a little bit about COVID-19 and the LGBTQ plus community where we have documented lesser access to health care. Are we in the statistics? Then I want to talk a little bit about our legislature. They're not meeting in person, but there's still things that should be going on. They have not yet approved a budget, which would be nice. And then a plug. The census, please, if you haven't done it online yet, 
please do do it. You know, they've extended the period of time for which they're going to be collecting census data. And keep in mind, for each person counted in Vermont, that brings in over $4,000 per person in federal funding. Even though, you know, the LGBTQ plus communities are disappearing from health and human services and civil rights enforcement, et cetera, the money comes to Vermont. And once it gets here, we can have some input in how it's being spent in the programs that are being targeted and supported. Last kind of plug, keep in mind what I have said on previous shows about your medical record and this state agency called VITAL, because as of March 1st, they just got access to your complete healthcare record. Do you know what's in there? Do you know what they're getting? This is where we also used to talk about events. Well, with stay at home, social distancing, there are not public events happening, but please go on organizations' websites and look at the virtual events that are being sponsored, such as the one this past weekend that was sponsored by Rainbow Umbrella and Momentum, which was a virtual coffee hour. So, and did you know that this is Lesbian Visibility Week? Say hello to a lesbian. So Linda, it's back to you. Okay, well, I guess I'm going to say hi to a lesbian. And by the way, Ian, that cat is really cute back there licking herself. <laughs> okay, and um, I would like to report on um, the death of a friend uh, in New York City, um, Vittoria Opeto. She reportedly died of a heart attack brought on by the coronavirus. She was a wild girl, and for those of you who do not know, WOW began in 1980 as an international women's theater festival. She was a working class poet and the only child of Italian immigrants. She and I read our poetry together at the LGBT Community Center in New York City. Anne and I were meeting her for dinner at a restaurant. She said she had the only authentic Italian pizza in the city was at this restaurant. Um, let's see. Uh, reading, realizing we were going to be late. Uh, we were on a bus. Ann and I were on a bus to meet her at this restaurant. And um, we found ourselves on a crawling bus down Fifth Avenue in New York, which you can imagine. Um, she yelled into the phone when I called her and said we were going to be late. Oh, for God's sakes, get off the damn bus and take a cab. So we did. She was crusty and tough and generous. Rest in peace, Victoria. And I have a picture of her um, during the wow days and also a later picture of her. Um, so. And we've not lost another lesbian icon in Phyllis Lyons. In 1955, she started the Daughters of Politis. She, she died at 95. Lyons and her partner, Del Martin, began their relationship in 1952 in Seattle, Washington. In 1956, they began publishing the latter, which, had, which published, along with other authors, the work of Lorraine Hansberry. Phyllis and her partner fought for LGBT equality when it was neither safe nor popular to do so. And I have a picture of her. May I say something? I think it's Phyllis Lyon. Yes. Did I? Hey, Phyllis Lyon. Oh, I said Lyons. Sorry. Um, and, uh, Let's see, uh, Virginia governor signs first LGBT clue inclusive civil rights bill in the South. Ralph Norton, Virginia's governor, signed the values 
bill last week. Um, and also, um, Christine Hulquist apparently, um, and for any of those who don't remember, ran for uh, governor in the Democratic Party here in Vermont, um, got uh, coronavirus, um, and she is recovering at home and doing well, last I heard. Pete Kriegs Kriesman, who was kicked out of the military, is now running for office. After becoming a victim of the Trump purge on transgender service me members, she is looking to make history. If she is elected in the Oregon Congress, she's running in District 42 in Portland and would be the first transgender woman to run the state legislature. She identifies as a socialist Democrat and proudly places her LGBTQ identity front and center. And now I have a picture of the guerrilla activist Rev. Billy, who's 69, decked out in a pink suit and a bandana mask, was arrested on Sunday aft afternoon in Central Park at um, a field hospital in New York City run by the evangelical son of Billy Graham. Ray, uh, what's his name? Graham. Franklin. Franklin Graham, thank you, Anne. Graham has a long anti-LGBTQ history. James Finn tried to volunteer, but he was told to sign what they call a statement of faith, which stated that to work there you had to conform to evangelical principles. We all know what those are. Um, and, uh, he refused, and so they told him that his services were no longer needed and he could leave. Uh, so, uh, three cheers for Reverend Billy. And may now, I, may I add something? He's yeah. Gay, Finn, and one of the specific um, precepts of this statement of faith is that marriage is between a man and a woman. I mean, there's this specifically homophobic codicil in this statement that he refused to sign. Also, anti abortion and. Um, you know, but you know, most people I think have an idea what evangelical beliefs are at this point. But yes, point point taken, in. And may I say one more thing? This is uh, <coughs> a theory that I've heard that Cuomo and De Blasio allowed this evangelical group to set up in Central Park to pacify Trump and Pence so they could get more aid. That's what it's come to in this country. So yeah. that's all I have to say for well, right thank now. You. <laughs> well, thank you, Anne, for, um, I won't say butting in, but for uh, <laughs> adding to this. So uh, where are we going next? We're going to Keith, right? Are we going to Anne? I'll go. Um, I just have two, let's go back to South Latin America if we could. Um, the Peru story I was talking about, uh, the specifics are the Inter-American Inter Court of Human Rights ordered Peru to pay a transgender woman arbitrarily detained and raped by the police in 2008. Um, in a ruling, she said, the court said that Asul Rojas Marin had been the victim of an act of torture in 2018, um, and she it ordered the court ordered the government to pay her unspecified damages. Um, she was detained by police in 2008 in northern Peru, and while in custody, was stripped, hit, and raped with a truncheon by police. Um, she had filed a criminal complaint, but the case was dismissed by state prosecutors and human rights groups took it to the Ameri Inter-American Court on her behalf. Um, the decision came as Peruvians contend with measures enacted by the government to curb the coronavirus outbreak, but Peru has ordered men and women can only leave the home on separate days. And of course, this 
leaves trans people in a terribly vulnerable position. So, um, and our, let's go back to Argentina also, if we could, because um, I find, as a retired English teacher, I find this very exciting news. Um, President Alberto Fernandez, whose picture before you now, took office, took office in December. Um, and he has publicly used gender neutral language. His decision to do so again at a moment of public crisis underscored the reach of a movement that is challenging the longstanding rules of language working to make Spanish used in Argentina more inclusive. We're always talking about equality, and the truth is that language reveals the inequalities that exist in society at large. Isn't that the truth? And the person who's speaking about that is Buenos Aires City Dr Judge Elena Libertori, and she's pictured before you right now. Uh, she is significant in this controversy because she started it by issuing a ruling in which ordinarily gendered words were spelled with an E instead of an A or an O that generally denote feminine or masculine in Spanish. Um, and so action was brought against her and uh, the, the uh, complaint was defeated, ruled crazy to, in the vernacular. Um, the quest to make Spanish less gendered is not limited to Argentina. In the US, um, some politicians and scholars have embraced the word Latinx, which I've been using for a long time, which is an alternative to Latino, the masculine form of the word used to encompass everyone as the default in Spanish. Now, the Royal Spanish Academy, which oversees the most authoritative dictionary, uh, has ruled the new formulations as an aberration. They say we don't need it. Um, Judge Liberatore said she'd long been conscious of the way language can uphold societal norms. When she was sworn in in 2000, the sign out Inside her door, the sign inside her door read Juez rather than the female term for Judge Huesa. She changed it later. And when she issued this gender, gender root neutral ruling, uh, a group of lawyers before the city council um, sued her and the council decided with her. We've joked that we should name the manual after her, the lawyer who filed the complaint said, an attorney who represented um, Judge Libertori in the matter. So that's very exciting news from Argentina, um, but it's not only Argentina. The shift in language coincided with the rise of the feminist movement in Argentina that coalesced around a campaign against femicide or the killing of girls and women because of their gender. That campaign, called Not One Less, was critical to broadening political support for legalizing abortion, a legislative priority also for Mr. Hernandez. Non-speaking, non-Spanish speaking countries are also grappling with the place of gender in language. In Sweden, the effort has reached preschools where teachers avoid pronouns like him or her, referring to children as friends or to use the gender neutral pronoun hen. And maybe Keith can speak to this since he has been exploring this question, not in Swedish, but um, in another language. Okay, in the US, linguists say they use uh, they commonly. It still needs to be accepted more widely, I would opine. But in Argentina, Mr. Fernandez, besides being prime minister, who's a law professor, courted the movement to make language less masculine when he campaigned for president. 
In his campaign logo, the word todos, which means everyone, was rendered with a symbol of the sun in lieu of the second letter O. So that's the end of my segment. I have much more to tell you about, but I will cede the floor to Keith. And as you can tell, when we're not sitting side by side, we sometimes forget who's supposed to be speaking next. So to first address Anne's last comment, it's Han, it was originally Finnish, but the rest of the Scandinavian countries have started adopting it. It was a entirely new pronoun that had no gender or class affiliation. And the Finnish government presented it at the UN and said that it was their gift to the world. So, and I personally have been using it under my name because pronouns and I are just not a good mix. Thank so, you, Keith. <laughs> so I would like to talk now about the FDA and blood donate blood and plasma donation and men who have sex with men. Historically, during the height of the HIV and AIDS epidemic, men who have sex with men, and it doesn't matter how you personally identify with orientation or gender identity, if you were a man who had sex with another man once, since 1981, you were permanently banned from ever donating blood or plasma. Within the last year, that has been changed to men who have sex with men can only donate if they have not had even a single sexual encounter within the past year. In the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, They've changed the ruling again. And this time it's men who have sex with men can donate if they have not had a single sexual encounter within the last three months. While this is a step forward, it still is not in keeping with true scientific research where it doesn't matter who it is you're engaging in that sexual encounter. It's what you do and how you do it. They are continuing to stigmatize, to discriminate, and to look in the wrong direction. How this got into the national debate was a gay male doctor in New York City who had COVID-19 and recovered and wanted to participate in the plasma study where they could use his antibodies to see if it helped in the recovery process of somebody who was truly struggling with COVID-19 and he was rejected. What then got added into the national conversation is even though the FDA had changed the regs, they didn't do it in consultation with the Red Cross or the other major blood donation organizations. So men who have sex with men, who indeed had been celibate, for the preceding three months would show up to donate and got turned away because the staff at the donation centers had not been trained on the new protocols. And the computer software they were using is so outdated that they couldn't update it to include the new protocols. So even if the staff were trained when they tried to enter the data into the computers, the donor was rejected. So not only are we continuing have to have to fight regarding old biases that have no scientific basis, let's talk about the COVID-19 pandemic in general. There's been a recent conversation how race was not being identified and that when they added race in to the demographics, they found that minority communities of color are disproportionately represented in both the individuals who are COVID-19 positive and those who have died from COVID-19. 
And part of the basis for that is this is traditionally an underrepresented group who does not have access to adequate health care. So they have greater underlying conditions that have gone undiagnosed and untreated. Vermont, within the past couple of weeks, has started including race and ethnicity in the demographic breakdown of COVID-19 cases. However, there is, you know, after race, there is an addendum that says, if known. So not everyone is collecting that data, so it is not necessarily there to report on, the same as ethnicity. LGBTQ+, we've been removed at the health and human services level for data collection. So other than our own healthcare organizations, no one is collecting data on the impact of COVID-19 directly upon the LGBTQ plus communities, even here in Vermont. And if we look at some of the stories that we've reported on our previous episodes, LGBTQ plus community, particularly the transgender community, does not have access to adequate health care, adequate support. What is the impact of this on those members of our community? So with that, I'm going to turn it back to Linda. Well, you know, that's very sobering, Keith, really about, you know, um, who's being counted and who isn't. And I, I just wanted to add to that list is that people dying in nursing homes is not really listed either. Um, and I, I think it's really important that we do that, especially looking forward towards the future about how we're going to take care of people, our seniors, in, um, you know, going forward. Uh, obviously, it is not a, a place that's, uh, you know, people aren't being really taken care of while there. So, A quick response uh, to that is, Age is indeed one of the categories for which they have solid demographics, but you are correct that, well, actually in Vermont, we do have how many of those died within an assisted living community because it is information that has to be included on the death certificate so that our Department of Health can retrieve it via that mechanism. I know, and, and but you know, in some other places, I mean, they have they have put people in closets trying to hide how many people have died within their nursing homes, and so it's just it's a huge problem. On a lighter note, I have some entertainment news. I just finished watching Black Lightning on Netflix. It's a comic book drama featuring black superheroes, one of which is a lesbian. And I've just started watching Winona, Win, Win, Winona Earp, who comes back to purgatory to fight demons. And yes, indeed, she is the great granddaughter of Wyatt Earp. And her sister is involved with a police officer who is also a woman in the series. So that was, that's a lot of fun if you like, you know, dramas in which there are demons who get killed and they're tracking them you know it's a good like a zombie thing but it's good it's really good um and the latest project from film and tv creator ryan murphy is an aspirational story of bygone hollywood that flips the script on the straight white male studio stronghold that was the golden age and instead delivers queer intersectional world and at the center of the story, pays homage to Rock Hudson and will be on Netflix starting May 1st. So you might want to put that on your calendar. In Florida, uh, What's Flo it called? in Florida, police chief, the police chief is now on leave while town officials investigate his alleged remarks about Broward County Deputy Shannon Bennett. The police chief said that the deputy died of the coronavirus because he was gay. So that's lovely. And it is National Library Week. 
And the theme for this year's library celebration, celebration has been find your place at the library. While the American Library Association had to flip the script to find the library at your place following recent social distancing restrictions, there are still some communities where LGBTQ youth, Q youth will have a hard time finding affirmative literature of any kind on the shelves of their local libraries. That's because LGBT themes, GTQ themes, are the most challenged in public libraries, according to the ALA's State of America's Libraries 2020. Eight of the 10 most popular books challenged had LGBT themes or characters, including the first six entries. So that's news from the library. So I'm gonna move on now to Anne. What's the name of that, Ryan, before you get off, what's the name of that last film you mentioned, the Ryan Murphy, was it? Yes, it was Ryan Murphy. What's the name of the film? It's called uh, Bygone Hollywood. Oh, thank you. Okay. Well, I'd like to start. Um, by introducing a member of our family who was mentioned earlier. This is Angelina, named after one of the Grimke sisters who's a little uninterested in our broadcast, but appearing occasionally in the background of my screen. Uh, another personal note, apropos of entertainment recommendations, I've been watching a virtual film festival um, presented by Women Make Movies, and they're free. You watch them on your computer. Um, I just finished watching a film called A Normal Girl about a young person who grows up intersex and her struggles. There are Q&As afterwards. You can find it if you Google Women Make Movies, go to their websites. It's really fabulous. We've seen a lot of good films. Um, now, I'd like to return, if I may, in my uh, discussion to Asia. I didn't give you any information about the harassment in the Philipp the harassment in the Philippines. Um, and what happened was on April fifth, volunteers in the in a village in um, the Philippines stopped and detained three LGBTQ people outside after curfew, two of whom explained they were running an errand for their grandmother. A village official accused them of looking for illicit sex and as punishment publicly humiliated them by ordering them to kiss, dance, and do push-ups on live video broadcast on social media. Uh, the incident illustrates um, the danger of unrestrained law enforcement, uh, which occurs under the guise of public health. Other individuals who violated the curfew were also subject to a range of punishments broadcast on social media. So that's a tale for our time. Um, now the good news I'd like to turn to is about this Asia's gay Netflix going global. Um, it's an LGBT plus video streaming platform called Gaga Ulala, and it wants to reach hundreds of millions of people isolated by the pandemic. With the LGBT community especially isolated, especially if they're living by themselves and not welcomed by family. We hope this provides relief, distraction, and entertainment, said Jay Lin, head of the Taipei-based political media. Wrong, portico media. Gaga Ulala, a combination of two phrases for gay people in Taiwan, is available in 21 Asian countries since launching in 2017 and will expand to more than 190 from early May. When planning the rollout, we never anticipated the pandemic, 
with three billion or more people in quarantine or lockdown, Lynn told Reuters. The lockdown has cut off, as we know, the lockdown has cut off traditional entertainment, uh, forced people to stay at home and driven millions of new viewers to sign up for Disney Plus, Netflix, and Amazon Prime. Media analysts expect the demand to keep growing. Taiwan endorsed, as we know, same-sex marriage last year, a milestone in its development as one of the region's more liberal societies. Available via website or mobile apps with about 300,000, no, I'm sorry, 370,000 registrants to the free section of the site, Gaga Ulala provides unlimited access to its LGBT films, TV series, documentaries from about $6 a month. One reason we set it up for May is because it will be the one year anniversary of the passage of same-sex marriage in Taiwan, Lynn, a prominent gay activist, said on the expansion. To mark the date, Gaga Ulala will stream a new documentary on same-sex marriage through the eyes of three same-sex couples from different generations. Gaga Ulala, which produces original LGBT plus content, has also contacted LGBT plus film festivals called offer or postponed in the crisis to offer them a new audience. A lot of LGBT plus organizations are thinking about what event or part of Pride can go online, said the co-founder of Shanghai, the Shanghai Pride Film Festival, which is due to be held in June with a decision on whether to go ahead set for May. And here I may parenthetically add, if you don't know, that New York City Pride has canceled for this year. And I think they may not be the first um, to make such a decision. Film streaming is definitely one of the best. You can do it at home. It's entertaining and a good way to keep diversity conversations going on, said this representative of Shanghai Pride Film Festival, whose festival has linked up with Gaga Ulala to show its features. So I have more, but I'm happy to give the floor back to Keith and see what he has to say. Hi, Ian. I did announce that New York and San Francisco Prides were both canceled. Did you? I did. I'm so sorry. I missed it. Oh, I apologize. <laughs> That's okay. We'll Time for Keith. <laughs> yeah. okay, Angela Keith. had you distracted. Okay. Ah. So guess where we're yeah. going? We're, we're, I don't know. We're going to go to the legislature, oh, and wow. let's talk a little bit about all the fun that they've been having. So, both the Senate and the House have voted to allow remote voting and video conferencing for committee meetings. Now, of course, this meant that they had to get a quorum present to do the vote. And in the House, it involved a member saying they were requiring that everybody show up. Did not go over well, but both chambers can now do remote voting. And then individual committees are continuing to work. Now, if you are interested in a specific piece of legislation, you, know, you can go onto the legislative website, the same as we always have, pull up a committee or a specific bill in which you are interested and see the status. Is there a committee that is doing any work on that piece of legislation? What is now included on the committee page is a way to access the video conferencing so that you can at least hear the conversation that's going on, or you can still sign up to present testimony. You can still be a witness. Now, they have put a number of safeguards in place after a very 
infamous encounter that happened with one of the Senate committees where someone hacked into the committee and they started streaming pornography and hearing racist comments. The state IT department has said they have put safeguards in place to ensure that that does not happen again. And anyone who has been using Zoom, and which of us hasn't these days, it's similar to using the waiting room function to allow people in. So the committee knows who it is that's on the line, who's participating, who they want to mute and unmute. And the host has the option of muting everyone who is part of the meeting. So looking at some of the pieces of legislation that we have reported on on previous episodes, I can't see that there is anything happening in House Human Services with the older Vermonter bill. And this was the bill that was going to set up some targeted programs for outreach to Vermont seniors community. And the, the Alliance and myself had introduced testimony about expanding their mission statement in the legislation itself to ensure that underrepresented communities such as the LGBTQ plus communities were actively involved. It can't, couldn't just be that, you know, the Central Vermont Counseling on Aging saying, oh, you know, well, anyone who is LGBTQ can come to our programs. They had to develop programs specifically for and including the LGBTQ communities. The other piece of legislation actually for which I have a high degree of concern right now is in the Senate constitutional amendment for which was the equality of rights provision. This would take all of the protected classes that we put into Vermont statutes and elevate them to the constitutional level. It, that amendment has to pass both the Senate by a two thirds majority and then the House by a simple majority before the end of this year for it to be able to be considered again during the next biennium to then go out for a statewide vote. I have not seen any action happening. It's in Senate Judiciary. I've gone in each week to look at what are the bills that they're video conferencing or holding committee hearings on. This has not been on the list and I have not seen any comprehensive statewide strategy to address advocacy and support for this piece of amendment. But then again, who knows? I mean, since legislators are not in the building and not caucusing, there is not the ready access to individuals to say, so what's happening? And knowing if there is indeed a plan going on. So that's what I have. Now, I, don't we have trivia? No, we have, we have trivia, but I don't have any more stories. Okay. So the answer, oh, I, I see Anne's hand is up. That's she right. To say Thank something. you. Um, I just want to um, clarify that when you said the alliance, you meant the LGBTQ Alliance of Vermont. Correct. In your first story. Yes. In case viewers might not know. The LGBTQIA Alliance of Vermont, <laughs> there is both a Facebook and a website for your dining and dancing pleasure. There we go. <laughs> so, September 17th, 1985, either of you have a guess? Yeah, they're shaking their heads no, because we're on camera and so, there's been a lot of conversation about how the COVID-19 pandemic, oh, this is just like the HIV and AIDS epidemic. No, it's not. And this is an example of how it's not. HIV and AIDS 
first New York Times story is 1981. September 17th, 1985, four years into the epidemic, is the first occasion upon which President Reagan even mentions the word AIDS. And it is only in response to a question that is posed to him in a press conference. It is not a statement that he did voluntarily. It wasn't until February of 1986 that President Reagan put the words AIDS into a letter to Congress talking about funding and support. And it wasn't until 1987, over 20,000 people had already died, that President Reagan did his first major speech on HIV and AIDS. COVID-19 and <clears throat> HIV, they are not the same pandemic. So on that, are we going to now end our show? Absolutely. Okay. So everybody, Pete, I had my hand raised. Oh, I, I missed it. <laughs> everybody, remember. Resist. Hold on, hold on. Anne has a comment. <laughs> I would just like to add that I read an article by John Weir who, who points up the huge differences, but also says a common thread is that government is totally incompetent. So as they are with this epidemic, I mean, I don't know how much, how willful it is in, uh, in the current pandemic, but you can't, you can't look to the government for anything, obviously. So no. that's my sour note on which I will, <laughs> I will end my commentary. Thank you for recognizing me. <laughs> Linda, take it away. All right, now. We'll see you in two weeks. We promise to try to improve. And um, we're very excited to be back and to be doing this. So remember, even though we can't go outside, we can still resist. resist. <laughs>